Good evening. Uh, let's call the meeting to order at uh, 6.31. Uh, first item of business is the roll call. Uh, Stephen Merrick. Stephen. Huh. I'm here. There he is. Kira. Present. Thanks, Kira. Trace Baker. Here. Paula Fitzgerald. I'm here. Jen Archuleta. Heather Williams. Present. Ann Overchain. Present. Scott Miller. Jim Krug, present. Uh, first Jen. item of business. First item Jen. of business. Sorry. Jen Archuleta is just now present. Oh, thanks, Jen. Let the record show Jen is present. Uh, the first item of business is the approval of the May 28th, 2020 meeting minutes. The chair will entertain a motion at this time. Yeah, this is Trace. Um, I move that we approve the 28th May minutes. I actually have a correction, and that is to remove Sue Anderson's name from the, um, the hmm. attendees that were present because she was not, she was already off the board last month. Good, good catch, Paul. I saw the same. I was going to mention. Good, thank you. Any others? Uh, would somebody else like to make a motion at this time? I move to approve the the uh, May minutes with the correction of removal of Sue Anderson's name. Is there a Heather, second? Heather Williams, second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Let the record show. Motion carries approval of the May 28th meeting. Next item of business is the CMN uh, cursed uh, 2020 town of Erie, uh, the taking, uh, and that we have Wesley with us this evening. Uh, so uh, Wesley, whenever, please begin. Good evening, um, Wes Lutz with the um, Parks and Open Space Real Estate Division. I'm a newer addition to their their staff and would like to present a couple um, town takings tonight. The first one is for the CMN Kirsch um, taking uh, by the town of Erie. And I'll pull up a, a slideshow here real quick. So uh, the, the taking from the town of Erie is needed to accommodate uh, a water pipeline and a public trail. Uh, this is going to be a 30 foot strip at the top side or the north side of the CMN Kirsch open space. Uh, the CMN Kirsch open space is located at the corner, the northeast corner of 119th Street and Arapahoe Road. Uh, the town of Erie proposes to acquire a fee interest or full interest in 1.82 acres from this piece of property. Um, this property is approximately 160 acres in size. And again, this is to accommodate um, the construction of a water line, as well as secondary use to build a public use trail above it. This next slide that I have here kind of shows a preliminary rendering of where the trail will traverse uh, east and west across that northerly strip. Um, Uh, both the county and the town share a common goal as far as enhancing water service for the public as well as improving regional uh, trail connectivity. Um, the purpose of the disposition is, uh, again, for the water extension, a secondary use as a public trail.
with regard to uh, taking um, uh, just compensation is afforded the seller, whether it's willing or not willing. Um, so in this case, we uh, went out and looked at comparable land sales similar to this um, property uh, in the general location of the property and arrived at a unit price of both about 37,000 per acre. When applied to the area being acquired, uh, we come up with uh, about 67,500 and that's a rounded figure. And uh, this has been vetted and we feel that this is a fair value for this portion of land. The last slide that I have here is just a, a, a legal description exhibit for the piece of land. Uh, north is actually to the left on this exhibit. Um, therefore, the 30 foot strip of land going all the way across the northerly, northerly portion of this property. Um, in closing, I'd like to note that we have uh, Wendy Palmer on the line with the town of Erie. Um, and I'd like to invite any questions you might have for her or myself with regard to the disposition or the town's project. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, hey, let the record show Scott Miller has uh, joined us. And uh, with that, uh, we will go, I'll just call out and we'll go down and see if anybody has any questions. I think it's, it's straightforward, but let's see. Scott, I'll start with you. Scott Miller, any questions? Um, I guess the only thing I have is, is the town of Erie up to speed as far as that whole property that adjacent to that is an ag property. So if you're going to go through there, you're going to have to be responsible for being able to shut that trail down when they have to spray and things like that. I just want to make sure that, that this, that Erie's aware of that and accepts those responsibilities as part of this transaction. And yes, we have been made aware of the agricultural use and the need for signing. And, you know, if the trail needs to be shut down during the spring, um, our parks department is well versed in shutting down trails and letting the public know about that. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Ann, any questions? No questions. Thank you. Thanks. Heather? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Jen? Jen Archuleta, any oh, questions? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> no questions, okay. thank you. Thanks, Paula? Um, no, it looks very straightforward. No questions for me. Trace? Uh, yes, Wes, you may have already answered this question in one of your slides, but in the um, uh, agenda packet, um, it discusses uh, the county and town partnered on developing trail system linkages so is that the slide that can, shows the blue line connecting the um, bike lane on North 119th to a trail that goes north of uh, Compass Street on the map there? That, that is uh, a rendition of that con connectivity. Um, again, this is a preliminary uh, drawing. Uh, the exact location will still be traversing that 30 foot corridor. Um, there is a residential um, development to the east of this property. And then we have 119th Street um, to the west of this property. So there will be connectivity across the north side from that area to 119. Okay, so you're, it's uh, nothing larger than just connecting those two existing trails. Not in this project, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Trace. Kira? No questions. Stephen? No questions, thank you. I have no questions. At this time, uh, do we have any online uh, comments, public comments, V? Oh, no attendees, okay. At this time, the chair will entertain a motion uh, this is Paula Fitzgerald. <clears throat> I move approval of this transaction as staff has described. 
Kira Pasquazi, I second. Discussion? <coughs> no discussion at this time, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Let the record show the motion carries. The taking, the superior taking has been approved. Thank you, Wesley. Thank you, Wendy, for coming out tonight. Wesley, you're still up with a, another taking. Okay, uh, let me bring up uh, the presentation for the second taking. The second taking is in the town of Superior for their 88th Street project. So the taking on this is a very small portion from the Hodgson Harris Reservoir open space. Um, it's located along 88th Street. Um, uh, I'll have a map coming up in the next slide here. Uh, the small portion is uh, four one hundredths of an acre. Outlined in blue in this map to the left is the Hodgson Harris Reservoir open space property. Um, and just to the left or west of the property is 88th Street going uh, north and south. Um, that's the road that they're doing an improvement project on. Uh, the purpose of the project is to um, increase or improve uh, multimodal connection between Superior and Louisville. And again, this area is four one hundredths of an acre uh, or 1,793 square feet. Um, the Hodgson-Harris Hodgson Reservoir open space is approximately 18.77 acres in size. So this proposed small portion, um, again, is, is to accommodate a multimodal improvement project between Superior and Louisville. Uh, again, uh, just compensation is due the county. Um, therefore, we went out and did some research on comparable sales. Um, and sales can uh, similar to this property in the area of the property was, it came in at about um, almost $48,000, uh, specifically 47,916. Uh, when you apply it to the small portion, it comes out just below 2,000. Um, the amount that we agreed upon with the town of Superior rounded up slightly to 2,000. Um, and again, the county believes that this uh, value is representative of fair market value in this area for this size and type of property. This last slide again is a, um, a legal description exhibit of the little tip of the westerly portion of the property that is being acquired to accommodate the project, uh, showing the 1700 93 square feet or four one hundredths of an acre. I believe that I have Alex from um, the town of Superior online as well. And I invite you to ask any questions of me or him with regard to the disposition or the project at this time. Thank you, Wesley. Hey, uh, is it Alex? Yes. Alex, could you please just for the record, give us your Last name as well, please. Yeah, my name is Alex Arinello, A-R-I-N-I-E-L-L-O, and I'm Public Works and Utilities Director for the Town of Superior. Thanks, Alex. Thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. I'm going to open it up for POSAC questions. This time I'll start with uh, Ann. Any questions? Hi, no questions. Thank you. Heather, any questions? Uh, no questions. Thank you. 
Jen, any questions? No questions, thank you. Paula, any questions? No questions for me. Trace, any questions? No questions, thank you. Kira, any questions? No questions. And Stephen? No questions, thanks. Thank you, uh, Alex, we might leave you off easy tonight. Let me check, is there any online public comments? At this time, the chair will entertain a motion. This Trace, I move that the acquisition be approved as described by staff. Jen Archuleta, a second. Motion being second, is there any discussion? With no discussion, it's time to move to a vote. All those in favor of this taking say aye. 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 Those opposed like sign. Let the record show motion was approved for the taking. Thank you, Wesley, for coming out tonight and taking your time on this and uh, getting us updated and up to speed on it. And uh, thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Glowacki and uh, the resource management summary. Thank you. So this is Therese Glowacki, and I am the manager of the resource management division for Parks and Open Space. And I try every year to come and tell you some of the cool and interesting and very important work that our group is doing. So I'm gonna share a PowerPoint with you. Okay, we good? Great. So the resource management division, it's a pretty big, it's one of the two largest divisions in parks and open space. And what you see here is a picture of our supervisors and those supervisors represent uh, the six work groups within us. We have 41 full-time staff. We have at least 25 seasonal staff, sometimes more, sometimes less. And the six disciplines that are in resource management are weed management, plant ecology, resource protection, wildlife, education and outreach, and forestry. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the highlights that these groups worked on primarily in 2019. So since weeds begins with a W, I started, I decided to put it first. <laughs> so um, weed staff, we have four FTEs and uh, between six and 12 seasonals. A lot of times we get state funding to help uh, pay for seasonal staff. That's why our numbers fluctuate so much. We have uh, several of them that focus on open space and on trails, some that focus on our agricultural areas and our natural areas, and then one full-time staff and two seasonals that work primarily along the roadside. So mowing them and revegging roadsides so that it's safe to travel and that we aren't transporting weeds up and down uh, the county roads. So some of the highlights that they worked on, um, this is a great before and after picture that shows um, what one weed intervention can do. So this is Canada thistle on our Western mobile property and our Western mobile property is um, just south of Highway 66, west of Longmont. And you see in the left, that's all Canada thistle. And with our, um, with our treatment, we were able to turn that field of thistle into milkweed, which as you all know, is a very, very important plant for monarch butterflies. So we are trying to increase um, native pollinator habitat with our weed management. So another project we've been working on for many years is um, improving the habitat on our rangelands. And our rangelands are a, a lot of times native grass, that we do um, have agricultural leases on, some of them, not all of them. And unfortunately, some of the plant communities have been degraded. So there's a lot of weed pressure on the native grass. Um, some of them are also restored. So, you know, we've been out there and we have planted natives. And when you disturb a soil to restore it, a lot of times weed pressure comes in again. So on the left, you see a lot of uh, the weed pressure on the Tommy Thompson property. And then once we took care of those, um, you can see it's the grasses that really have thrived out there. 
We also work a lot on Russian olive removal. Russian olives is a non, it's a non-native plant and it's very obvious. It's the, that light colored green that you see all up and down riparian areas. We um, years ago had a goal of removing Russian olive from all of Boulder County Park Service Space properties. And we worked really hard and we got about 95% of them. Well, unfortunately we keep buying new properties. And the other side of it is the uh, Russian olives, um, we cut them and then we treat them with an herbicide, but periodically they still will re-sprout. But the Russian olive that we worked on last year was primarily on the flood impacted properties. So again, once the flood came through, it disturbed the soil and made great, um, great seed beds for Russian olives to grow. And in 2019, we took out over 2,500 Russian olive trees. And they're nasty. If you've ever taken out a Russian olive tree, the thorns on them are very large. It's not fun work. So on to our plant ecology work group. We have five FTEs, three seasonals. We have a lot of volunteers that help us get our plant ecology work done. And then um, we also work with many partners, including wildland restoration volunteers. What you see in the photo here is a picture of our Gage property, and it's an area where our plant ecologist excluded cattle grazing along the south branch. And what you see is just by taking cattle grazing out, you have all kinds of vegetation that grow back up around, um, around the south branch. So we're doing this in more areas for a number of different reasons. Um, it's good for water quality. It's good for carbon sequestration to have healthy riparian areas. And, um, and it's great for, for biodiversity, both of plants and pollinators. So we worked a lot. Our plant ecology staff really have been focusing and we know people don't believe it, but we are still doing flood restoration work. So this map shows you where the areas are that we focused on with our flood restoration um, with some major, major, um, both county funding, FEMA funding, HUD funding, um, so all along the same frame, this is Lyons up here. So even west of Lyons on our Hall um, and Hall 2 property, and then all along the same frame where we have a lot of property that is not yet open to the public, but some of it is, Pella Crossing, some even east of Longmont, and then um, several along Left Hand Creek, which is which you see here, that's Ohio Valley Ranch, Gear Creek, which then feeds into Left Hand. Brew Baker, I'll show you some pictures on what we did out there. And then Beelands Hawk is right on the diagonal. You can really, you can see it from the diagonal um, just as you're entering into Longmont. So the flood recovery projects that we worked on, uh, the biggest one last year was at our, uh, was on Left Hand Creek at our Brew Baker Sorensen property. And you can see on the left what it looked like after the flood abated. You know, there are cut banks here, it's sloughing off, it ate, ate into the agricultural field, it washed out, unfortunately, it washed, washed out years of uh, restoration. We had been working on Left Hand Creek improving the riparian corridor for more than 10 years and the flood took that all out. So we were grateful to get funding from um, the county for this one and it was the county tax money that we voters approved to help work on flood restoration after, I think we approved it in 2014. And so the, it was about $460,000 that funded this restoration project. So you see on the right, what it looks like. Uh, and some of the totals, 2,200 feet of stream reconstructed. We put meanders back in it. And um, we saved some of the cut banks, the cut banks that you see up in the left-hand corner here. Those are great minor bee habitat. So we worked really closely with wildlife staff to make sure that, um, that we left some key features. There were over 4,000 plants planted, eight acres reseeded with natives, 1,000 willow and 100 cottonwood poles planted. And out here on this tree right here, a golden eagle decided to nest there this year. Mm. So our restoration is already providing good habitat for, for wildlife. Um, the golden eagle nesting there is shocking because all of our other golden eagle nests are on cliff faces like at Rabbit Mountain and up Left Hand Canyon. 
So to have one in a tree on the plains is very rare. And actually I saw it today, it has one, one nestling. So we have, that was the one that was constructed in 2019. We've been maintaining a lot of the other ones that I pointed out along the St. Vrain. And these were funded through the Emergency Watershed Protection Program, which is um, Natural Resources Conservation Service, federal money. So these are along James Creek, Left Hand Creek, and the St. Vrain Creek. So this kind of takes you through what it looks like. This is staff and contractors out planting. And you can see it's all cobble, hard as a rock. They're trying to dig holes to plant willows and, and cottonwoods. It's not easy work. Here's another one. These are willow poles that they planted as well along some of our creek restorations. And here the third photo shows you what it looks like after those willows have sprouted. So they uh, serve as bank protection, they serve as fish habitat, they stabilize the soil and, and, uh, and make the rocky area more suitable for other plants to grow over the course of years. So we had contracted out a lot of this work. And so a lot of our work in 2019 was assuring that the contractor fulfilled their responsibilities, that they kept the plants alive or they replanted when plants died and, um, and watered them. And there were over 10, we had to go out about 10 times, not we, the contractors had to go out and water these because hot, dry and on, on these cobbly soils, these plants can die without additional water. So some big numbers here. Um, over 3,000 willows, 5,000 trees and shrubs, and 3,000 wetland plugs. That's over 10,000 plants that had to then be monitored, watered, um, and in some cases replaced. So another big project that our plant ecologists worked on was vegetation mapping. We tried to get to every property um, within a 10 year time frame to do a vegetation map. And you see what the map looks like on the left. So each of these different colors show a different plant community. And this is all tied into Colorado Natural Heritage Program. So when we map a property like this, we provide the information to them and they can say, oh, this is the same plant community that we find in Larimer County or in Douglas County. So this is tied into a much bigger network that helps track um, that helps track our high biodiversity spots. Well, this area here, so this is Highway 36. Lyons is up uh, to the north, about a mile. Um, Nelson Road is basically the bottom of the map. So these are, uh, this is called the Tree Varton property that we just recently purchased the fee in, which is why it was a priority. And then the Lucanin Dairy, which many of you have been part of as we've been purchasing the Lucanin Dairy, um, the Lucanin Outlots, it was a 10 year acquisition. So we finished the 10 years. So we went out there and mapped these two properties. So these were identified by CNHP as um, the highest biodiversity and it gets the CNHP's highest ranking, a B1 for outstanding biodiversity on both of these areas. Um, so, in order to accomplish this mapping, periodically we've had it done by seasonals or our own staff. But in this case, we hired a contractor through our small grant program. So every year we have about $40,000 that we award in small grants. And so last year we awarded a small grant to a crackerjack plant ecologist and he went out there and covered the whole area. And he identified 350 plant species, which is more than 20% of the plant species found in Boulder County. So just this small area out here has 20% of the plants we find. So this is a really high biodiversity area because it's where the plains meet the foothills. So you have both plains plants and mountain plants. Um, so it was um, a wonderful accomplishment. We're, we're glad we have that done. Now on to resource protection. So we have five rangers that are primarily roving rangers. We have five resident park rangers. So they live on our properties. Uh, we have typically five seasonals 
And then we have a partnership with the sheriff's department, which um, is really wonderful because our rangers are unarmed and they um, periodically we do have, you know, higher risk issues. And so we have a long standing, it's probably a 25 year agreement with the sheriff's office where three of their officers are parks deputies, which means their beat is the parks department. Plus, uh, plus we share in, in a supervisor over there, a sergeant. So some of the things that our rangers did this past year, this we think is just a wonderful collaboration. So we have the property up, it's west of Indian Mountain, excuse me, it's west of Ron Stewart Preserve at Rabbit Mountain, it's called Indian Mountain. And it is, it is reserved when it was purchased, it is dedicated to um, Native American use. And we've had a sweat lodge up there for years and it was used by a small group of the Native, Native American community. Well, the, our main liaison passed away. And so last year we reached out to a larger group of Native Americans and said, are, is anyone else interested? And this group came forward and they are um, vets, like um, veterans from US wars. And they said they would like to be able to rejuvenate the sweat lodge up at Indian Mountain and host sweats up there. So we did a lot of them last year. And one of the um, main liaisons is Jeff Moline, you know him as, uh, as, our, as our planning manager. And then John Queen is our ranger here. So they were invited up for a sweat. Um, so they went up there, spent the day with this, um, with this Native American group and were given these gifts, these beautiful blankets as a thank you. So what we've done since that is we've moved the sweat lodge. It was in a pretty um, hard to reach area. It was not really easily accessible by certainly not by a, four, by a normal car. You needed a four wheel drive. So we've worked with them and found a better place on Indian Mountain, which is more easily accessible. And, um, and they've been using that. They've built new sweat lodges and they have a little um, shed up there to store their stuff. So this is just a wonderful partnership and it's really flourished. It's showing you know, our, um, the commitment of that purchase to go to Native American use and it really is taking off. So we're also reaching out to diverse communities through our ranger group. And so this took more than a year to foster this relationship with the San Lazaro um, trailer park in Boulder. And we had a seasonal last year, whose name is Juan Campo, fluent um, Spanish speaker. And then Sarah, um, Sarah's another, she's our caribou caretaker ranger. And they um, worked with San Lazaro and they did a couple of programs at the, um, you know, at the community center at San Lazaro. And then they got to know them well enough and invited them to come out on hikes. And they took them on a couple of hikes. This one was up at Caribou Ranch. And you could just see it's a multi-generational group. Um, they got to go to places that they had never been before. Um, they got to learn about what caribou, um, what you know, all the riches caribou has to offer and they loved it. They just loved this experience. So um, we had plans to do more of it this year, but those are all on hold because of COVID, but we hope to um, continue this relationship long into the future. So just some big numbers, over almost 12,000 hours of patrol with all of those staff we have out there. They hike, they bike, um, they, drive the back roads of the properties, looking at, um, at trespassing and encroachment and poaching and all those other things that we don't like to think happen on our property, but unfortunately they do. And one of our big commitments is the Hesse Trailhead, which is interesting because it's a Boulder County road that gets you up there. Uh, we own two properties near the Hesse Trailhead, but the Hesse Trailhead the trail itself takes you onto national forest land. And the trailhead with the parking is actually owned by the city of Boulder. So it's several jurisdictions. And if any of you have tried to go up there, you can attest to the fact that it is one of the busiest places in the mountains that we have. There's not really good parking. And so it's a, it's a safety nightmare. So 
Um, last year, well, we've done it now several years, but we had a staff that, um, a staff sometimes too, who helped facilitate both parking and the shuttle. And you may have seen, I don't know if it's made it into the newspapers yet, but the county has decided to reopen the HESI shuttle, shuttle this year, starting Saturday. And um, it's going to run every 15 minutes and it will be able to take six people. So a reduced load for COVID safety, but you can still get to HESI um, by public transportation. And then another big project that the Rangers work on is the Left Hand Outdoor Challenge. And that's geared towards um, high schoolers. And it's giving a lot of these people a chance to engage and learn about outdoor careers. And so it's an 11, they have 11 um, character building outdoor education programs that these, um, that these youth do. And they kick it off early in the year um, by doing an overnight hike. So that's the photo that you see here. They hiked, they went up to the Forest Service and hiked down to Heil Valley Ranch. And it was some of the kids' first time ever hiking. So um, it's a great way to build our next group of resource managers. So then on to our education and outreach. Some of the work that our education and outreach do is they conduct all of our visitor studies. So we can tell you how many people visit Heil Valley Ranch in a year and how many are on bikes. Um, they do cultural history interpretation. So at the Ag Heritage Center or the Ned Mining Museum, um, we have a host of volunteer naturalists. We have over, well, we have over 200 and probably 240 volunteers between cultural history interpretation and, and our volunteer naturalists that help us go out and, and um, educate both students and the public and any kind of group. We also produce the Images Magazine, and then our staff are out on park patrol as well. They're the lighter side, they don't wear uniform, I mean, they don't wear the badge, um, and they can't give any tickets, but they're out there telling people where, how long the trail is. Um, this year, what they're out there telling people is, do you have your mask? Could you wear it at the trailhead? Um, so they're very important interacting with the public, kind of sometimes the first or only staff that the public sees. And on that staff, we have seven FTEs and five seasonals. So with our, um, on our cultural history side, we have four museums and we had a record breaking visitation in 2019. So our biggest one is the Ag Heritage Center out on Highway 66. And if you have not been out there, um, we hope to be able to have some programs out there and have it back over to the public sometime, um, sometime in the near future. Um, we have the Doherty Museum, which is a partnership between the county and a private entity, the, um, the Doherty's who own this museum. It's out on Highway 287, just south of Longmont, full of wonderful old cars and old musical instruments. And we help staff that, we help coordinate the volunteers that staff that. We have the assay office up on Wall Street in the foothills, and then the Ned Mining Museum. And the Ned Mining Museum is right at the round point as you enter into um, Netherland. And we had 6,829 visitors go to the Ned Mining Museum. So here's a picture of the Ned Mining Museum. It is chock full of wonderful artifacts. Um, it was the Netherland Historic Society that collected all of these artifacts and then their volunteer organization was having trouble. And this had to be uh, probably 10, eight or 10 years ago that the county commissioners, uh, they approached the county commissioners and said, can Parks and Open Space take this on? And the county commissioners agreed. So we have been running it now and we've cleaned it up and made it really accessible. And you can see on the right, we have hands-on exhibits and um, we do gold panning up there um, for kids. There's old fashioned clothes kids can try on. And it's just a, a it's the first thing you see when you get to the town of Ned. So it's very popular with out of county residents. And our breakdown last year was 50% of the visitors are from Boulder County and 50% are from elsewhere. And volunteers really are our greatest resource. As I said, we have a 
about just shy of 250 intercultural and natural history programs. And those are basically interpreters. So you can see um, they lead hikes for school groups or they lead public programs or they'll talk about wetlands. Most of our volunteers have been volunteers for three years or more. And they cover birds and bugs and bats and box elders and so much more. So they led 482 programs in 2019 and they, they reached over 10,000 people, which is about 21 people per program, which is a pretty good size. Um, you can see in the photo here, we have one of our cultural history volunteers. Um, this is Blake. He's out here working with a school group that came to the Ag Heritage Center. And at the Ag Heritage Center, we have live animals, we have a garden, we have some heritage fruit trees. Um, so it really helps having these volunteers that can interact in smaller groups. So this is a group of, you know, eight or 10 kids versus having 21 people that one person would interact with. We also worked on two other things uh, last year, iNaturalist and fishing. We do a lot of fishing programs. So the iNaturalist program is really fun. It's a, it's a app that you get on your phone. And when you go out there, if you see a bug or a bird or a plant or anything, you can take a photo of it and submit it. And it's basically a catalog of the, you know, the wildlife and the plants that we have here in Boulder County. And it's a nationwide um, program. So it's citizen science at its finest. We participated in the City Nature Challenge last year, and we participated as a region. So we were, um, Boulder County was in with Denver County, and um, I think maybe even Jefferson County. And in that, um, in the, it was a two day event where you're supposed to go out and capture the photos of everything that you see. They identified over 900 different species in that little bio blitz. So it, it, um, it's a wonderful way to engage people um, who are out on our parks or they can use iNaturalist in their backyard. And then a lot of the fishing programs, we have regular standard, standing fishing programs that we do like Kids Gone Fishing. And um, that's a program where we encourage kids from five to 15 who have never gone fishing before to come on out. We teach them, we give them a little bit of the basics, we have poles for them to use. Um, they bring their parents, hopefully, and there's a way to introduce kids to, to that activity. We also have a junior senior fishing derby, which we do every year at Walden Ponds. And I believe, oops, sorry, um, I'll finish with the junior senior fishing. It's um, where you have uh, a senior citizen that can fish because we have one pond, the Wally Taves Pond that is only open to seniors. Um, so it's a day when they can bring their grandson or their neighbor that they wanna get involved in fishing. So those are some of the fishing programs. So then the other group of volunteers that we work on are our volunteer resource monitors. So these are people that um, really get out and get dirty. And they go to the field with one of our staff members, whether it's a wildlife biologist or a plant ecologist or a ag staff, and they learn how to take measurements of things that we are trying to keep, um, that we're trying to track, like our bluebird boxes. So we have a host of bluebird monitors. Um, they go out and they, uh, they visit them weekly for about two months and, and tell us about whether the bluebirds use the boxes, whether they hatched, how many they hatched, and that sort of thing. We have burring owl volunteers that um, assure that if a burring owl is using any of our agricultural properties, that we know about it beforehand and we can put protections in place to assure that the burring owls can successfully nest. And like I said, um, it's just runs the gamut. We've got ag staff that have soil health volunteers that go out and um, test the organic matter in the soils and, and help us report on the quality of our soils. And here are some of our volunteer resource monitors in action. There's the bluebird box monitors on the left and butterfly inventories on the right. Jan Chu in the photo is one of our very, very long-term volunteers. 
Um, she actually has a book on butterflies in the front range. On to wildlife. The, our wildlife staff work on threatened and endangered species protection. They work on elk management, which we brought to you just a few short months ago. Uh, they work on monitoring, wildlife monitoring, like our raptor monitoring and the burrowing owl monitoring I just mentioned. They work on habitat improvement projects. And we have five FTEs in this group. And uh, this year we have one seasonal. So some of their accomplishments were working with uh, Eldora Ski Resort uh, on an agreement. And this, this project was brought to our attention by Ron West, who's in the photo there. Ron West is a parks employee, but he really reviews all of the land use dockets. So he knows when new construction projects are going to happen or new roads are gonna be built and he reviews it on the environmental impacts. And so he identified the Peterson Lake, which if you've ever skied at, um, at Eldora, you've driven right by it and I'm sure you've seen the ice sheets across it. So it was um, getting sedimented in and we did some surveys out there and found um, a very rare, a globally threatened um, cap shell. It's a snail that lives in fresh water. So we worked with Eldora Ski Resort to come up with an agreement to improve this habitat. This habitat is listed as critical wildlife habitat in our environmental resources element of our comp plan. And the measures that they are taking are sediment catchment basins, native rock ramps for habitat, water quality monitoring, and they have <clears throat> approved to allow us to um, continue monitoring the snails out there. So this is a really fun and fabulous project. So this is, we call it the Red Belly Dace Collaboration. So with, um, back if you remember the slide I showed you of all the properties that were flood impacted along the St. Vrain. Well, we own five of seven miles of the St. Vrain, Vrain River between Lyons and Longmont. And it is the best native fish area in the front range. We have a lot of small native fish that are um, globally rare or imperiled. And so our wildlife staff have been working with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, um, helping restore the native species to those, to the St. Vrain. In order to do that, they formed a partnership with the St. Vrain Valley School District Innovation Center and Oceans First, which is a nonprofit. And the Parks and Open Space Foundation contributed funding for it. And what this project does is they are raising the red belly dace. So they're working with a school district. So they had um, huge tanks in the Lions Junior Senior High School that the kids in their science classes were raising. These are huge aquatic um, tanks, like an aquarium you'd have in your living room. And they they got the dace from CPW, and they're the kids are raising them. Once the dace are the right size, they're, we're going to release them into Webster Pond at Pella Crossing. So again, tying it back into the flood project, Pella was really badly damaged during the flood. When we were looking at restoration, we got a CPW grant to turn Webster Pond into good habitat for native fish. Um, and so that's where these will be released. So it's a whole circle. It's education, engaging the students. It is um, raising the fish and it's using our recent restoration as a good place to, um, to release them. And eventually we're hoping um, to have good healthy populations of the red belly dace here in the front range. Oh, and the side note is that um, with COVID, when the schools shut down, they, the kids weren't at school and no one could take care of the fish. So Matt Kobza, who you see here in the photo, second from the right, he and his wife took the tanks home, these six gigantic aquarium tanks, and they've got it all set up. They have to monitor the water daily. They have to clean the tanks regularly, keep the fish alive, move them from tank to tank when they get too big. And they have a live stream webcam on the fish. So the students can still be engaged in the project. And it's actually out there for the public to see too. So um, it's a broad reaching educational 
project. And there's a picture of it. Those are the, that's one of the six tanks that Mac took home. And there's the little tiny fingerling. So another big project wildlife worked on was beaver relocation. So tying it back into Webster Pond at Pella Crossing. So Webster, the beavers decided that our creek restoration or our flood restoration at Pella uh, was great habitat. And so we had a family of at least seven beavers that made it their home. And while they were building their dams and making it a good home for themselves, they were flooding Webster Pond. So Webster Pond would no longer be a shallow wetland for the red belly dace. It would, it would be too deep. So we worked with CU again through a small grant and CU identified good beaver habitat through our open space properties. And they found that Caribou Ranch was a great beaver habitat. And as a matter of fact, there's a, an area, wetlands um, near the Deland Homestead at Caribou Ranch that had former beaver ponds, but there were no beavers up there now. So we hired a beaver expert. They trapped the beaver, what you see here. They made a stop at parks and open space so we could all see what the beavers looked like. And let me tell you, they were as tame as can be. Um, and then they took them up and released them at Caribou. And then what you see here on the right is we set up a remote camera and we captured the beaver um, several months after the relocation. And then this is also the beaver up at Caribou. That was a daytime shot. So the beavers appear to like their new home up at Caribou. Uh, and then wildlife and outreach. So here's the picture of the junior senior fishing derby. So we have wildlife staff and education and outreach that, um, that work together helping educate about fish and run these, um, these wonderful public outreach fishing days. So forestry, um, our foresters, they do in-house forestry projects. They're usually small in nature, maybe 10 to 20 acre projects. And then when we do a big forestry contract, like 150 acres or more, even 70 or 80 acres, um, we contract that out. So we have staff that manage the contracts. We do prescribed fire, trying to reintroduce fire into our ecosystems to help um, help control the amount of biomass that's out there, the slash and reduce fire danger. We also do inventories on, um, on the health of our forests. And we run our community forestry sort yards. So um, if you've been up, well, if you live in the mountains, you likely know about our community forestry sort yards. They are, um, air, there are two yards, one's in Meeker, um, just north of the Boulder County line and the other one is in Nederland and they are open for slash disposal to, for the public. So if you're doing fire mitigation on your property and you live in Boulder County, you can dispose of your trees for free. What we do is we take that, we sort it and the good wood goes to heat our parks and open space building and the slash and that sort of thing. Sometimes it goes to our restoration projects and sometimes it goes to a composting facility. We do all that work with six FTEs and sometimes six seasonals. We have fewer than that this year. So last year, it was the first in many years, probably more than 20 years, we did a public holiday tree sale up at Reynolds. And Reynolds Ranch was an area we did a forest thinning project. So if you look at the picture on the bottom right, this is what Reynolds looked like before we did our forestry work. About 10 years ago, we did this patch cut here and then all of these lodgepole pines are regenerating. And to keep them nice and healthy, we wanna thin them out. So we had a tree, a Christmas tree sale. So you see what lovely Christmas trees came out of that. Since it was our first, we, um, we limited it to two days. We gave out 100 permits, but 81 people came out and they brought with them their friends or family. And it was just a wonderful day. People um, that participated were so grateful to have gotten the permit. And it wasn't, it wasn't first come first serve. So it was very organized. Um, so we'll hope, we are hoping to be able to do that in the future with our other restoration projects. We did a lot of prescribed fire pile burning last year, over a thousand piles. 
um, the three main properties. So these are areas where we would have gone in and done forest thinning projects. And then we have our youth core build the slash piles and we let them cure for a year. And then we go and um, burn them. Just it's easiest disposal. It's the easiest way to dispose of this material. Um, so Walker Ranch, Reynolds Ranch and Hall Ranch are the three main areas that we burned on to reach that thousand piles. We also did a project across Magnolia Road from the um, Christmas tree area. This was a contracted 47 acre Aspen enhancement. And we started in 2018, finished it in 2019 and it cost us 168,000. There was a lot of material that came off and we appreciated it because that's what kept us warm last year at our parks and open space with the biomass heating. 73 truckloads, 660 tons. And this is the before and after. And here's another before and after. And do people say, are you sure? Is this really the same area? But lo and behold, here's your two aspen trees here. And then we took out all the conifers. So you can see all the aspen that have um, been released and it looks beautiful up there. If you drive down Magnolia, it really, it's, um, it's a nice green aspen meadow. So that is it. This is the, the last picture here um, shows you the beaver ponds in the winter at Caribou Ranch and our plant ecologist helped restore them and the beavers are, like we said, um, really doing, putting the final touches and living happily ever after at Caribou Ranch. Yeah, let's, let's do this. We're coming up on 7.30. So I uh, do want to allow for some questions, but I don't want to get too backed up. So I'll just quickly ask if you guys have uh, questions for Trace. And of course, she's always, uh, I'm sure, available if you guys want to stop by or, or dig down in any of these uh, six areas. But let's start with uh, Heather Heather Williams. Do you have any questions? For uh, no, thank you for the great presentation. I always like hearing about all the projects, but I don't have any questions. Super, thanks Heather. Jen, do you have any questions tonight? Uh, no questions, just uh, to reiterate what Heather said, you know, great job and the whole staff on keeping the properties just beautiful. Yeah, good, thank you. Paula. Um, again, no questions and keep up the good work. It's pretty exciting to see what the county's doing. Trace. Yes, uh, Trace, a very good presentation. Um, do you have a question with um, here in the year of COVID, will you still be doing uh, prescribed burns? And if so, uh, how is the process going to change? So prescribed burns are on hold for right now. And that was a sheriff's department call. Now the sheriff's department, we work with the sheriff's department mitigation crew. So the crew that does wildfire, they fight wildfires, which would also typically do our prescribed burns. They're still on. And so in case we do have a wildfire, we have a crew. And, and of course we tap into, you know, mutual aid, a lot of firefighters up and down the front range. But for the time being, they have canceled all prescribed fires. So there won't be any this year. Understand and thank you. Okay, thanks, Trace. Kira. Yes, thank you. The scope is just uh, magnificent. I appreciate the level of detail. I was wondering, in terms of uh, resource protection, um, in our time when there's calls for defunding the police and um, reevaluating uh, use of force, has that been a part of any of the conversations in terms of your relationship and partner, long-term partnership with the sheriff's department? So it has not, but that's a really good point. And I, um, I'll bring it back to our senior ranger and, and ask what is happening. Now, I know the sheriff's department is um, being engaged in that conversation, you know, for its street patrol and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know. I think that's an excellent question to ask. It's a pertinent question for this time. So I'll find out. Thanks for following up. Thanks, Karen. Mm -hmm. Steven. No, thank you for the presentation. No questions. Scott. No questions. Ann. Uh, really great work. Um, keep it up. Really great presentation. No questions. Thank you, Ann. Uh, I have no questions, uh, Teresa. Thank you for all that information. I'm sure you probably could use another uh, dozen or so people 
<laughs> oh, easily. <laughs> they, do, they do everything that you guys do. So my, you know, my concern is uh, we're in that mode of, uh, in COVID of do more with less. So uh, appreciate you guys do the best, and particularly the Rangers. I, uh, I, I usually try to get out in the open space every day. And usually uh, when I see so many people, like you said, without mask and that other stuff, I, I, I realize I should speak up and say something and not just be passive. But likewise, I realize that what the Rangers have to deal with uh, on a daily basis. So uh, hats off to them, hats off to the staff. So thank you for coming out tonight and uh, sharing all that with us. And uh, we do have, we do have, it don't go away because we do have an online uh, individual, I think, Nick, who would like to ask a question. Yes, Mike Smith from Boulder is um, here to, to join us. So Mike, um, waiting to see Mike here. I just unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mike. Go ahead. Yeah, Mike, good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, please, uh, just state for the record your name and address, and then if you could keep it to about three minutes, and uh, we'd appreciate to hear from you. Thank you. Oh boy, I read the, on the web page that you were allowed five, and I, I wrote to that deadline. How about it? Go. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Mike Smith, 4596 Tally Ho Trail. That's in the Red Fox Hills subdivision immediately south of the East Twin Lake. And I'd like to talk to you about resource management, actually resource neglect and mismanagement at Twin Lakes Open Space. If you open the Twin Lakes Open Space page on the Boulder County website, the very first sentence is, quote, this open space is a haven for wetland wildlife, a hidden gem in the heart of the gun barrel area. Sadly, that hasn't been true for more than a decade and things have gotten much worse over the past few years. I wanna plead with you to reverse resource management's neglect and non-management of this abused and damaged area. On the page of the Boulder camera on Monday, June 8th, there was a large color photo of two women throwing sticks and balls into the West Lake for their dogs to chase. Just beyond those women out of the photo, there's a three foot high erosion cliff that extends for at least 30 meters along the Northeast corner of the lake where thousands of dogs have also gouged out their launching ramps every few meters as they jump into the lake. And the exact same thing has happened on the south and southeast banks as well. The entire north bank, maybe 100 meters, has been ripped out to nothing more than exposed tree roots, and that edge of the lake itself has been completely beaten into churned mud by unleashed dogs chasing sticks, wildlife, and each other, while their oblivious humans, also unleashed, do their own thing up on the trail. When Gun Barrel Center was built over a decade ago, the city didn't hold the developer to his promise to include parks, trails, and playgrounds. And so the thousands of new residents quickly found a nifty substitute at Twin Lakes Open Space. Word quickly went around to the, about this great place for people and dogs to hang out with two breweries right across the streets. No surprise, the former haven for wetland wildlife was soon destroyed. I used to walk the lake several times each week. I seldom go there anymore because the neglect and damage just breaks your heart. I do remember watching an unleashed golden retriever charge into the West Lake at a heron that was trying to fish out in the middle. The heron flew off and the dog tracked back through the mud to its owner who thought the whole thing was quite funny. Resource management's neglect is responsible for a good part of this mess. I well recall a conversation with Therese Glowacki during the big fight over the Twin Lakes parcels about five years ago. She told me very bluntly that parks and open space never wanted Twin Lakes in the first place, but they were forced to assume management because of the liability concerns of the ditch company. She said that if it had been up to her, Twin Lakes would never have been added as open space. Folks, that attitude shows and we locals see the results of POS neglect and mismanagement at Twin Lakes every time we go over there. It's no longer a haven for wetland wildlife. It's been allowed to degenerate into nothing more than an abused overcrowded dog park. But it gets even worse. The open space has now also become dangerous, a violent crime scene in the making. Two recent examples make this case. On June 6th, the wife of a Red Fox Hills senior citizen neighbor posted on our subdivisions listserv, quote, be careful on lake trails, 
Marty was walking around the East Lake at the noon hour today and was shoved and verbally assaulted. It was a runner who seemed to be racing a companion around the lake. He just about ran Marty off the trail with no mask and Marty was on the far right side of the trail. He came around again and bumped Marty hard with his arm, at which time Marty signaled him to slow down. The next time around, he came at Marty head on and shoving him hard and screaming profanities, told him he was going to kick his ass. He ran off still screaming profanities and calling him names, scary. On June 16th, someone posted on the next door Twin Lakes group, quote, our friend had a gun pulled on him today at 1.10 p.m. at Twin Lakes by a biker who his dog Fiona chased and barked at for a bit while he was on the off-leash side of the lakes. Please share with anyone else you know that walks there or is near there to be on the lookout. Try and take a video to share with police if you, if you see him. So I urge you to come out and see the damage for yourselves. POS needs to step in, regain control, and fix that damage before it gets even worse. And since your ranger personnel are not armed, I also urge you to get the Boulder County Sheriff's Department to begin patrols there before it becomes a violent crime scene. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Mike, yes, thank you for coming out tonight. We will, your information will be put into the record. Uh, we don't get into a Q&A with uh, the public on these kind of comments, but we do, and the staff has heard your comments, and we will make sure that it's entered into the record. So thank you for coming up tonight. Understood and thank you. Is there any other online uh, comments, Nick or B? All right, thank you. We will now move to the next item on the agenda, the POSAC bylaws update and approval with Eric, please. Hey everybody, uh, Eric Land, Director for Parks and Open Space. Uh, so we are back at it, the bylaws that won't go away, uh, but hopefully will tonight. Um, you have in your packet the uh, amended bylaws that reflect the conversation that we had at the last meeting. We discussed this, which I think was two meetings ago. Um, and since that time, um, staff reflected on the comments, which um, largely... The, the recommendations largely from you on how the, the bylaws could be improved uh, was to try to modernize them, I guess I'd say. We're all, this is a, this is, this is a first, the way we're doing this, and um, CPP and the Board of County Commissioners all are working to deliver better and more effective um, public opportunities to engage in public meetings like this while we're um, because of the, the virus in a more virtual reality. So your comments really had to do with trying to modernize um, the bylaws to allow that a little bit more easily. Um, and so we've done that. The copies that I think you have in the packet are both a clean version and a red line version. So you can see what was um, added and amended. And um, I think it's I think it's as straightforward as that. Uh, be happy to take any questions that you have. Um, otherwise, I'd, I'd like to get your recommendation to move these forward to the board for their final approval and adoption. Hey, thanks, Eric. Hey, Eric, I'll, I'll start as chair and then I'll throw it to Jen as uh, co-chair, let, let her uh, anything administratively. The question, only question I had was, is that, or is the POSAC the same, uh, in other words, um, any other committee in the county is using probably the same guidelines, I would think. In other words, the commissioners, we didn't come up with something just for POSAC. There's a lot of other committees meeting. So I would think the POSAC bylaws look very similar to say the planning bylaws or any other grouping. Would yeah, that that's, that's correct. Um, POSAC is one of the more active uh, advisory committees that meets on a more regular basis, um, maybe similar to the the Planning Commission, which um, has a different role and different responsibilities, but does also meets on a regular basis with um, items of public concern. Um, so uh, Community Planning and Permitting, CPP, formerly Land Use, um, has been working to update theirs as well. But as you may recall, um, it's been a couple of years now, but the county, uh, the Board of County Commissioners decided to try to streamline and um, make more consistent 
the bylaws that were governing the 20 some odd advisory boards that we have. So um, we did run the revised version that's in front of you for your recommendation to the board back through the Board of County Commissioner's office to the staff members that have been trying to keep these things moving in the same direction to make sure that we weren't going off on a, on yeah. a lark. That's what I was like. Okay, super, thank you. Uh, with that, I'll turn it to Jen. Um, I have no questions or concerns. I'm uh, grateful that you guys took a second pass at it and addressed some of the issues that we had. So I think it looks good now. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Paula, any questions? No questions. And, and yeah, I think, um, you know, you addressed everything we discussed before that was problematic. And, um, and I personally, um, just my view on the virtual is it's, I think it goes pretty well. And I think there's a lot of people in the public who have a hard time getting down to meetings who might enjoy that as well. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, Paula. Trace? Yes, Eric, uh, thank you for, um, providing the revised text and uh, particularly with the uh, markups visible so we could see what changed. Um, I won't require this change, but I'd like to suggest that the um, authority for physical and electronic meetings could be expressed with greater, greater, greater clarity after a little bit of reorganization. Um, in the current draft, Section A establishes regular physical meetings Sections E uh, mentions procedures for electronic meetings without first having established that electronic meetings are possible. And then section J allows electronic meetings under certain circumstances. So what I'll propose is moving section J to follow section A immediately um, or to expand section A so that um, A itself establishes recommend uh, regular meeting days and times and special meetings. Section A.1 would establish physical meeting locations and section A.2 would establish the authority for electronic meetings. Um, and I wouldn't change the text of these suggestions, just reorganizing them a little bit. Okay. Oh, so that's uh, that's my comment. All right. Thank you, Trace. Kira. Yes. Just want to say thank you for using they, them, and their pronouns. Appreciate it. <laughs> very, very, very good, Kira. Steven. I'm good. Thank you. Scott Miller. Good here. Thanks. Ann. I'm good. Thanks for taking a second pass at this. Heather. Uh, I... I'm good as well, and, and I'll reiterate uh, thank you. Thank you for the revisions. And Nick, do we have any online comments or anybody wishing to comment on screen? At this time, the uh, chair will entertain a motion. Scott Miller, I move that we accept, we adopt the new bylaws as presented. Jen Archuleta, second. Any further discussion? Without any further discussion, let's move to a vote. All those in favor of approving the bylaws updated, say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Let the record show the motion carried. The bylaws are update is approved. The last item of business tonight, once again, live from Longmont, Colorado, we have Mr. Eric Lane with the director's update. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Jim. Uh, so director's update. First, in the good news department, um, you may have read that Great Outdoors Colorado awarded the county a $1.25 million grant to support acquisition of the Tucker property west of Netherland, which you um, recommended to the board a meeting or two ago. Um, for context, this is the largest acquisition grant that the county has ever received from GOCO, and it's our first acquisition grant in 14 years, um, and thanks to Sandy Duff who led that effort. And also in the Keep Giving Us More Money department, um, GOCO also awarded uh, Parks and Open Space a $23,000 grant through CPW to fund half of the elk hunt coordinator 
uh, position that's filled by Jenny Dalton. So it was a, it was a good month in the, the world of grant giving to Boulder County. So thank you to GOCO and CPW. Um, in the COVID-19 Be Damned department, the cultural and natural history volunteer training has gone virtual. Um, during the lockdown, staff uh, had the opportunity to transfer much of the volunteer training to online manuals and video tutorials that will serve us well in the future, whether we're all in person or want to have more stuff available online. Uh, to give you a brief update on what's going on on the ag side, um, with respect to the GE transition, MAD Agriculture, who's our uh, contractor helping us, uh, they've been working with farmers to plant several warm season trial crops, including white sorghum and buckwheat, uh, five types of edible dry beans, and an interseeding of clover into standing corn as a change of practice. And um, just so you're aware, we are planning the first of three field days with the tenants on July 6th and 7th, separate but the same um, session. It will be restricted just to a small number of participants due to COVID-19. So we're, we're having two back-to-back -back duplicate uh, meetings to accommodate uh, the tenants and a few others. And then um, related but slightly different, um, you may, you may remember that we have embarked on a five-year demonstration project with CSU on carbon sequestration in agricultural settings. We have both a cropland and a rangeland demonstration. I wanna just give you a brief update on the cropland demonstration, which is at the Quicksilver property, which is uh, just southeast of Longmont. Um, it's been in triticale as a, as a certified seed crop. Uh, this spring, it's going to get harvested in a couple of weeks, and then it will immediately go into a clover cover crop uh, to keep a living root in the soil as long as possible. Uh, in other news, just kind of going around the horn of things that get done at Parks and Open Space, um, building and historic preservation team is completing exterior repairs and painting of the uh, historic farmhouse at the Ag Heritage Center on Highway 66. I haven't driven by it lately, but somebody says it's incredibly white. So I think we have a fresh coat of paint on there. Um, the trails team has started building the skills loop at Heil 2 near the Corral Trailhead. Um, and they are the trails team is also working at Walker Ranch to uh, replace steps and do repairs to improve the, the wall section, which is um, down by the creek on the far east side of the loop. Um, in the real estate world, I wanted to let you know that yesterday, uh, Mary Jo Langstrat and Mel Stonebreaker completed the closing on the remainder of the Canino 7M ranch property, which is south of Longmont and is uh, on the very eastern edge of the county. Um, and also because it's in the same area, I wanted to let you know that the condemnation effort that you may know about uh, on Panama Reservoir has um, been voluntarily withdrawn by the Metro District in Weld County. So that's a very positive step. Um, but I think the concern of Metro Districts being able to uh, essentially co-opt and condemn municipal and county water resources like that has raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, and I don't think the county or many of the municipalities are done um, with their concern about that sort of potential effort in the future. So the county is continuing to um, look at its options to prevent things like that from happening. Um, and then lastly, um, this is going to be slightly long, slightly involved, but you'll hear, you'll hear more about it from us. Um, but I, I want to let you know that in order to improve and ensure public safety at our, our trails and trailheads, the department's increasing trailhead staffing, um, especially on the weekends when we're the busiest by employing former Boulder County Youth Corps team leaders as trailhead ambassadors. We've had a few out there, we're hiring more. Um, and if you've bumped into them, um, hopefully uh, haven't bumped into them, you've been socially distanced by six feet. Um, those new staff are helping to make the visitor experience better by addressing some of the parking issues that we've really been experiencing during COVID-19, encouraging visitors to wear masks and providing ones that visitors forget. Um, and also directing them to the less busy trailheads if the parking area is full. Um, and what I wanna dwell on a little bit is that, um, I think you probably all know, but I think it bears repeating that 
um, as the county and state and federal experts all strongly advise or require the public to wear masks when entering both public facilities and private businesses, or when social distancing isn't possible, uh, rangers and our trail ambassadors will be asking visitors to leave if they don't have a face covering with them. We wear masks to reduce the spread of COVID-19, especially when we know that a significant portion of the population can be asymptomatic carriers and contagious, even if they don't know it. Um, and I feel very strongly, and the department feels very strongly that parks and open spaces should be places where everyone feels comfortable being, especially those in our community who are the most vulnerable. So in alignment with our current county public health guidelines, as well as um, state guidelines and federal recommendations, we require visitors to have a face covering and to wear it at trailheads and at any time on our trails when social distancing cannot be maintained. Um, and while many people will come to open space because they, they will be able to more easily maintain social distancing, unless you're on a regional trail or at a few places like the road at Rabbit Mountain, it's not possible to always maintain six feet distance from other users. Um, and hence the necessity of bringing a face covering for use when, when conditions warrant it. So I think it's important um, that we continue to message to the public that um, visiting open space um, requires a bunch of things. If you're gonna be a good steward, you should be prepared. Um, you should be gracious with other trail users that you meet. And right now with um, the public health situation that, the way it is, you must have a mask with you and you should use it um, when you have to be within six feet of people, which is obviously gonna be um, a high potential in a trailhead and certainly will happen on many, if not most of our trails throughout the, the network. So we're gonna continue to talk to the public about that. Um, I think it's important that people not ease up. Um, I think we're all seeing numbers um, starting to rise, COVID cases around the nation. And I think our parks and open space visitors, while they are always welcome, um, everyone should be prepared uh, with a mask to do their part and be um, mindful of other members of the community who may have um, health concerns and to, to be courteous and responsible. So I just want to um, remind everybody of that. And I think you'll see more from us about that in the near future. Thank you, Eric. Hey, Eric, uh, that's why in that previous segment, I'll just make a comment and then I'll flip it to Steve and we'll go, we'll go around one last time to put you in the barrel. Uh, Eric, but uh, I mentioned that earlier when uh, Therese was talking because today I just did it because I had uh, sort of a boring run, but I saw uh, one other person besides me with a mask out of 15 joggers and six bikers, none, none of them had a, a mask. So I think it, it maybe brings V into a PR piece to how do you get that message out, Eric, because I, I got to believe a lot of people think, well, I'm on the trail, I'm in the open space, I don't need a mask. And I see a lot of people carrying them in their car when they go into shop, right, go into a store. But when I see them get out and get on the trail, I don't see too many put a mask on. So yep. good luck with that. So with that, I'll, I'll shut up and I'll turn it to, we'll come up and give everybody a try at uh, Eric one last shot this evening. Steven? Uh, support your feelings about masks on the trails and, um, I, I do think it's getting the message out. Uh, that's key, but I, I'm with you on that. I see the same thing Jim's saying. I yeah. live right near the Lagerman open space, as you know, um, and the AHI, and there are very few people wearing masks out there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Kira. No comments. Thank you. Trace. Yeah, my um, experience on the trails that have been limited to um, one-way loops uh, have been very positive in reducing the number of encounters. Um, but my um, uh, informal counts uh, have been that, you know, uh, mass compliance has been maybe 50%. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm glad to see that the ambassadors and the rangers and now um, uh, Michelle is allowing volunteer rangers to uh, uh, advise visitors on masks. And I think those are all very positive steps. Thank you, Trace. Paula? Yeah, um, I concur with the, the um, promotion of mask wearing. I see a lot of people wearing masks around their neck 
and just not pulling them up. And um, just wonder if there's other trails that could be one way, uh, like Trey said, the, I think that's a really effective way to just minimize that kind of exposure. But I really appreciate what you're doing because this is, this is a crazy time and it doesn't seem like we're out of the woods yet. So thank you for that. Okay, Jen. Hi, um, hey Eric. Yeah, uh, regarding the mask, I have two things. Regarding the masks, I don't know, it's completely anecdotal, but I've noticed that the earlier morning hikers who are kind of older folks, they get up earlier, always seem to be wearing their masks. Whereas the afternoon hikers who are generally a bit younger or come from out of town, not as much. So I don't know if having more staff later in the day, I, I don't know. But anyway, it was completely anecdotal, but I've been hiking a lot and I've seen it pretty consistently. And then my second thing, since you are going to increase the staff at the trailhead, and I don't know if we want to take responsibility for this, but I've seen at Heil, um, people with their dogs show up and I've stopped them and said, hey, there's no dog trail, blah, blah, blah. Well, where can I go? Nobody tells me where I can go. They can only tell me where I can't go. And so I'm always directing them, well, if you go into town, the city trails, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know if that's information that we want to provide formally with respect to here's where you can go. Don't come here. You're here now, but please leave and go here. Mm -hmm. Since we're already going to have people out there talking with masks, maybe we could have them also add on dogs to their repertoire. Yeah, great. The great suggestion. I'll route that to uh, Michelle to let her know that when she's doing the training and messaging to our ambassadors to wherever they are to have a sort of ready couple of answers up their sleeve for dogs. Good point. Thank you, Jen. Heather? Uh, no comments. Thank you. Anne? Hey, Eric. Really appreciate your efforts on the masks. And uh, I know um, when I when I thought one thought I had, I we're, don't see a lot of mask wearers or users on the Picture Rock Trail here in Lyons, and wondering if you're also if you've thought about or if you already are equipping our volunteer bike patrollers with masks to possibly hand out um, to both the bikers and hikers and runners on those trails it might just be another another volunteer that could help. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ann. Scott Miller. Uh, just echoing what other people said, I don't envy this trying to map monitor this. I know watching in Rock Creek, I see a lot of people with masks, but most of them just have them with them and aren't wearing them. So, you know, which I, you know, on the one side, I mean, I'm outside working all day and I, you know, it's not my idea of a good time either, but as, you know, I guess, the key is to watch and make sure that they've got them on around the trailheads and when they're getting, you know, in areas where it's more congested and it's, it's a tough, it's a tough problem to watch and monitor. And it's, I, like I said, I don't envy you guys, but I know watching a rock Creek, you guys are doing a good job with it. So. Okay. Thank That's you, Scott. Good. Hey, Eric, two last items, then we'll adjourn. One is, is that, uh, should I, should we as POSAC members plan that we're going to be looking at computer screens next month for this meeting? You should indeed, I think uh, for the foreseeable future. Thank you. And then a second point, thanks off. I, I forgot last time, thanks to uh, Nick and Renata and uh, V for uh, putting all this together. And uh, I know that's not uh, the easiest thing sometimes having done so much this the past couple of months. So hats off to the staff who came out tonight, appreciate it. And uh, with that, I'll hit my fake hammer here and we will announce this meeting adjourned. Thank you all. Everybody.